Hi, I'm Bruce Heinrichs, Professor of Psychology. Uh, in this video, I'm going to introduce you to the sexual disorders that are in the found in the DSM, the official book of the American Psychiatric Association. The DSM is the official book of diagnosing mental illnesses. And in the DSM, uh, the current uh, edition is five, DSM-5, the sexual disorders are divided into three big groups. The first group are called sexual dysfunctions. I like to think of these as performance problems. These are problems that people have. Oh, couples are trying to have a sexual relationship and there's something going wrong, maybe a man can't get an erection or the woman can't get an orgasm or there's pain involved. So sexual dysfunction is a funny way to say it is uh, there are sexual problems that aren't against the law yet. Uh, so yeah, you, people are trying to have a sexual relationship and they have uh, something that is causing trouble. That is called a sexual dysfunction. Uh, the second big category are called the paraphilias. Uh, philias uh, is a suffix that means um, something like uh, enjoying or liking. In this case, it refers to getting pleasure from sex uh, in a way that's considered inappropriate, uh, maybe culturally unacceptable. Uh, so, for example, using certain objects in order to get sex or uh, using pain to get sexual enjoyment or having sex with children, which of course is very, very bad uh, for <laughs> society, for children, can cause uh, serious troubles. So these are uh, sexual disorders, the paraphilias, that we would say are rather unacceptable and often are against the law. The third category is a sort of controversial one. It's called now gender dysphoria used to be called gender identity disorder. Sometimes in adults, it's called transsexualism. And what this means is that a person is unhappy with their gender. Gender is uh, your sort of mental way of thinking about yourself as male or female. And so a person might say, I know I look like a man, but in my mind, I'm a woman and I don't like this fact that I have this contradiction. This is called gender dysphoria. The person is unhappy with their uh, gender being different than their biological uh, sex. So those are the three categories we'll look at in some of these slides. Are sexual disorders very common? Yes, sexual disorders are very common. Some experts say that maybe 50% of married couples have uh, a, a complaint, a problem with their sex life, but most of them do nothing about it. They just live with it. So you can look at this uh, chart on this slide. Uh, you'll see that um, sexual disorders are sometimes divided up into these categories. Um, these, um, this particular slide refers to uh, sexual dysfunctions, that is, uh, complaints that people have about their sex life. Uh, so we have low desire, which is um, very, very common and much more common in women, but a very common problem that people just don't have sexual desire. Secondly, an arousal problem, the problem getting the body aroused. Third is lack of orgasm. A fourth is too rapid of an orgasm. This is more common in men than in women. And then last, pain during sex. These are some of the categories of sexual dysfunctions. You can see that these are fairly common problems, but because people get uh, embarrassed or humiliated in talking about sex, a lot of people with sexual dysfunctions do not go get help, even though we have some pretty darn good treatments for sexual dysfunction. Sexual dysfunctions are uh, performance problems that people have. You go to a psychologist or a doctor and a couple will say uh, we're having trouble with our sex life. That's called a sexual dysfunction. 
Now, these have been studied the most by a Dr. William Masters and a sociologist, Virginia Johnson. In fact, Masters and Johnson were married to each other for a while and then got divorced. Uh, when they were married, they were studying people in their laboratories. They were studying the physiology of sex. In other words, what goes on in your body during sex? Uh, and what they discovered they call the human response cycle, the human sexual response cycle. Uh, and so this is divided up into stages. There's the excitement stage, a plateau where physiological function kind of levels off, the orgasm stage when physiological arousal increases dramatically, and then a resolution, which means go back to normal. On the left here on this graph, you see men, and men all have a, essentially the same physiological reaction to sex. And on the right, we have women, which is slightly different. So women have a little more variation in the way that their bodies respond to sex. Uh, very much today in uh, most big cities in the world, there are now uh, sex clinics where people can go get therapy for sexual dysfunctions that are based on research by Masters and Johnson. There's even many movies and TV series based on Masters and Johnson's research. Here we see that in the DSM, there are uh, four categories of sexual dysfunctions. Remember, when we say sexual dysfunction, we mean uh, performance problems that couples are having. Uh, with their uh, sex with their sex life and so the DSM divides into four categories sexual desire problems sexual arousal problems so sexual desire means I just don't have the desire for sex arousal means my body can't get aroused orgasmic disorders like a, a woman might say I, I just can't get an orgasm or a man might say I, I have an orgasm too soon and then pain disorders those are the four uh, categories found in the DSM Okay, what is it that causes people to have sexual dysfunctions? Of course, there are many, many different factors, and here I have divided them into four groups, the biological factors, the psychological factors, sociocultural factors, the way that you are brought up in your society, and then interpersonal factors, the, the uh, relationship uh, kind of problems. So uh, there are many different factors often working together uh, that cause people to have sexual dysfunctions. Here we have a short list of psychological factors uh, that can lead to sexual dysfunctions. So things like uh, having excessive fear, uh, having stress or anxiety, these, these interfere with sexual uh, performance. Uh, depression, maybe anger, conflict, uh, sometimes there's excessive need to try to please the other person to, to be focusing so much on the other person that your body uh, can't re can't uh, react uh, physiologically. This is sometimes called spectatoring, that you become a spectator rather than uh, being involved in a sexual activity. What are the treatments for sexual dysfunctions? Well, it's interesting because lots of people have sexual dysfunctions, as I as I said before, Masters and Johnson have estimated about 50% of married couples have some kind of sexual dysfunction. So it's pretty common for people to have problems with sexual uh, life. Um, now, what's interesting is there are treatments that are very effective for almost all of the sexual dysfunctions. Uh, but people who have sexual dysfunctions do not seek out the treatments. Even though they're very effective, people don't seek them out because of embarrassment. And they're just humiliated. They nope. People who have sexual problems. People don't want to talk about it. So the problem is, even though we have good treatments for sexual dysfunctions, people don't use them, don't seek them out. Uh, as I mentioned, there are clinics everywhere in all big cities, Masters and Johnson clinics. Well, okay. Here's an example of treatment for premature ejaculation. There's a squeeze technique that can be used where one partner 
squeezes the penis of the other partner when they when the person feels the ejaculation coming this is using classical conditioning to teach the person's body not to ejaculate uh, until uh, the other person is satisfied so uh, with premature ejaculation uh, the definition is that the person ejaculates too soon uh, well what's too soon people always want to know a, a time but it isn't based on time it's based on the um, satisfaction of the partner. If the partner's not satisfied, then it was too soon. Uh, anyway, that's easily treated using the uh, squeeze technique. Uh, now, there are men who have erectile dysfunction. Um, erectile dysfunction, if it's primary erectile dysfunction, it means a man can never get an erection. Uh, so for example, a man who has a spinal cord injury uh, and cannot get an erection. In that case, the man can have a penile implant that in which uh, there's a, a some tubes for example implanted sometimes a, a device that you can uh, manipulate planted under the skin of the penis and if it's the tubes you can then pump uh, fluid into them to make it hard to make the penis uh, erect uh, for men who have secondary erectile dysfunction this means that they sometimes have trouble getting an erection but not always uh, there are medicines like Viagra, sometimes called the little blue pill. <clears throat> yeah, that's the uh, kind of polite way of saying it. Viagra uh, and similar medicines increase the flow of blood to the penis, and this helps uh, get an erection. Uh, another type of sexual dysfunction is called vaginismus, in which a woman has been uh, sexually assaulted, and now uh, when she gets sexually aroused it, through classical conditioning, she gets upset, she gets tense, she gets nervous, and this uh, tightens the muscles around the vagina, and so it makes it very painful to her, for her to have sexual intercourse. This is treated through uh, systematic desensitization, just through exposure therapy, by very gradually, carefully working your way up towards relaxation. So. Uh, it's important to be relaxed uh, during sex. If you're nervous, either men or women, if you're nervous, this interferes with sex. Anyway, the point is there are good treatments uh, for sexual dysfunction. A second category of the sexual disorders is called paraphilias. Philia, that suffix, means the love of or desire for. And para means unusual. So paraphilia is unusual ways of getting sexual satisfaction. Uh, some people like to have pain. They like to feel pain that gets them sexually aroused. That's called masochism. Some people like to see others in pain. They get sexually aroused when they see other people suffering. That's called sadism. Uh, and then there's pedophilia, which means sexually uh, turned on to children which of course is very very harmful and we do not want that in our society uh, voyeurism which means uh, looking at people watching secretly watching people having sex like peeking in people's windows exhibitionism which means exhibiting yourself this is what uh, only uh, only men are exhibitionists women women aren't considered exhibitionists for some reason in our culture so men might go out and, and reveal their genitals to strangers. That's called exhibitionism. And then fetishism means um, the use of an object to get sexual satisfaction or a part of the body. So a person might use the, the foot, for example, uh, to get sexual arousal. So these are called uh, paraphilias. Here is a list of some of the paraphilic disorders from the DSM-5. Um, we could think of um, paraphilia sometimes as being illegal and, of course, very harmful. And other times they're just a sort of odd or unusual way of getting sex that we might uh, find uh, funny or, uh, or some, something to uh, joke about. Um, but um, DSM lists uh, these different categories you can see here. Uh, sometimes uh, people with paraphilias are arrested. Perhaps they're put into court-ordered uh, treatment uh, for the paraphilia. And we have many different uh, types of psychological treatments for paraphilia. 
and they are uh, somewhat successful, something like a uh, success rate uh, approaching 75% in some cases. So we do have some success with uh, treating paraphilias. Uh, you can see a list here of some of the uh, treatments that are used, sometimes psychological, sometimes drug, drug treatments. Okay, some people have what is called gender dysphoria, which means their, their biological uh, sex does not match up with their gender identity. This is sometimes in the past was called gender identity disorder, sometimes called transsexualism. Uh, the DSM now uses the term gender dysphoria. So gender identity is created mostly by development of the hypothalamus prenatally, which is influenced mostly by uh, presence of testosterone. It's possible therefore for a person to have a male sex or a female sex, but have the opposite gender identity. This happens more often to men than women. It is not the same thing as sexual orientation. Sexual orientation means who you are attracted to. So some people are attracted to men, some are attracted to women, some are attracted to both, some are attracted to neither. That's sexual orientation. Gender dysphoria is sometimes called transsexual in adults as opposed to cissexual. Cis means the same, trans means across. Transgender is a broader category that has lots of different possibilities you'll see on the next slide. And some people have what is called a sex change operation, maybe more appropriately called sex reassignment surgery to try to make their body match their gender identity. Uh, this slide is sort of a cutie little gingerbread person, which a uh, genderbred person, excuse me, which shows these different uh, characteristics of our, our, our sex and gender. So we have our gender identity, which is on a scale. How do you think of yourself as more male, more female? We have our gender expression. How do you express yourself as more male or more female in your culture? And then you have your biological sex, which of course can be intersex. Uh, are you more male? Are you more female? That's on a scale. And then who are you attracted to? That's your sexual orientation. So these are different components of our sex and our gender. Okay, that brings us to the end of this video. Hope you uh, learned a lot and enjoyed it. And check out my other videos on my YouTube channel called Brucey. Bye, and here's to psychology. Keep studying psychology.